everyone. This is Brooke Shipwright again with the National Low Income Housing Coalition. We're going to go ahead and get started because uh, we have a great uh, amount of information to share with you today. So thanks again for joining today's webinar on Advocacy 101. We hope that this information will be helpful to you whether you're attending Capitol Hill Day on March 27th as part of NLIHC's policy forum, or if you plan to schedule meetings with your elected officials in the future. So first, I just want to go through a few housekeeping notes. The slides and recording of the presentation will be available on our website, and you will also receive an email with the slides and recording. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to type them into the questions box, um, which should be on the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Please use that box rather than the chat option, um, and we'll be sure to take a break to answer questions a few times throughout the webinar. Um, I'll be presenting on today's webinar along with Elena Calibro and Kyle Arbuckle, also on the field team. Uh, so today we will start by discussing the basics of the federal legislative and budget process. We will then explore why we advocate, offer tips for your Hill meetings, and walk through an example of a legislative meeting. Kyle and Elena will do a role play to provide an example of a Hill meeting and how to answer difficult questions. Then we will answer any of your final questions uh, from the audience. Well, we will not cover policy priorities on today's webinar. For those of you who are interested in NLIHC's talking points for the upcoming Hill Day on March 27th, we'll have an additional webinar on March 12th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time to cover NLIHC policy priorities to discuss with legislators. We will send you the link to sign up for that session in the follow-up email from this webinar, though many of you may have already registered for it. So let's begin with a brief overview of the legislative process. There are three branches of the federal government, the legislative, executive, and judicial. Today we will be focusing on two, the legislative branch, which is better known as Congress, and the executive branch, which is often referred to as the White House, the administration, or the president. Congress is made up of two chambers, the House of Representatives and the Senate. The House of Representatives has 435 voting members, plus some delegates who represent U.S. territories and the District of Columbia, but do not have voting rights in Congress. Representatives are elected for two-year terms. The number of representatives per state depends on the state's population. California has the largest state population and 53 members, while Delaware and a few other states only have one representative. Each representative covers a geographic district, which varies in size depending on how many people live in an area. The second chamber of Cong Congress is the Senate, which is a smaller body. It's comprised of 100 voting members elected for six-year terms. Each state has two senators, which means that almost every American has two senators and one representative. Again, there are not senators for D.C. residents or Americans who live in U.S. territories. If you're participating in Hill Day, most of you should be doing three meetings, or in other words, one with each of your members of Congress. The two bodies of Congress are responsible for creating laws. I'm now going to turn it over to Elena, who will walk through how a bill becomes a law. Understanding how a bill becomes a law is very important, so you know where in the legislative process you can have the most impact. For a bill to become a law, the first step is for it to be introduced which can only be done by a member of Congress. The idea for the bill can come from the member themselves, the president, individual citizens, organizations, or companies. The president may put forth a plan, but it's always a member of Congress that submits the actual bill. A member of Congress will take the bill idea and introduce it into their respective chamber. At that point, it receives a bill number and is posted on congress.gov. If you want to follow a bill's progress, you can track them at congress.gov. Once the bill has been introduced, it then goes to committee. Both the House and the Senate have committees on a range of topics. The committees that NLIHC pays attention to are committees on appropriations, budget, veterans affairs, and transportation and infrastructure. There are a few committees that have different names in the Senate and in the House, but do similar things. For example, the Senate Banking Committee and the House Financial Services Committee both have jurisdiction over issues pertaining to the economy, the banking system, housing, insurance, and securities and exchanges. The House Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee are both tax writing committees. 
Committees are led by the committee chair and the ranking member. The committee chair is a member of the majority party and the ranking member is the committee lead leader of the minority party. Currently, the chair of each committee in the House is a Democrat and each in the Senate is a Republican. And in both bodies, the ranking member is the opposite party of the chair. The House or Senate leadership can then decide if and when they will schedule it for a floor vote. In committee, the bill is edited, also known as marking up, and then the committee decides if it will go to the House or Senate floor to be voted on, or if it will stay in the committee. The floor refers to the entire House of Representatives or the entire Senate. Most bills die in committee, meaning they're never passed to the floor. Bills can also die after passing out of committee if the House or Senate leadership never schedules them for a floor vote. When a bill goes to the floor, members of Congress can speak for or against the proposed bill before the final vote. As a note, in the House, the Speaker of the House can determine how long a bill can be debated, when the debate is over, and whether to move forward with the vote. In the Senate, members can take over a debate on the Senate floor in order to prevent a vote on the bill. This is known as filibustering. The Senate can end a debate with a vote passed by 60 members. When the bill is ready to be voted on, a simple majority is needed for it to pass through each chamber. And once the bill passes in each chamber, a conference committee made up of House and Senate members meets to reconcile any differences between the two versions of the bill. The conference bill then goes back to both chambers where it gets voted on again. And if it passes, it goes to the president. The president then has two options. He can sign the bill or he can veto it. There are multiple ways a bill can be vetoed, which we won't get into on this webinar. But if the president does decide to veto a bill, Congress needs a two thirds majority in both the House and the Senate to override it. Now that we've gone over how a bill is passed, it's time to discuss the budget process and where your input in this process is needed. So I'll turn it over to Kyle. Thanks, Elena. Um... I'll now go over the budget process as she mentioned. So at the beginning of each year, the president provides a budget request to Congress. This budget outlines the administration's priorities for federal programs. Federal law requires that the president's budget request is released on February 1st. However, it's very rare that this actually happens. Based on the president's proposal, the House and Senate Budget Committees propose budget resolution, resolutions that set targets for spending and tax revenue. These resolutions are sent to the House and Senate floors for a vote where they can be amended. A House Senate conference then resolves any differences between the two chambers. The budget resolution for the year is then adopted when both chambers pass the final conference budget bill or report. The congressional budget resolution is not an ordinary bill and therefore does not require presidential approval. The House and Senate budget committees could decide to pick a different number for the budget resolution than what the president has recommended in his own budget. So following the adoption of the budget resolution, the House and Senate Appropriations Committees take the discretionary spending set forth in the budget resolution and divide it among each of their 12 subcommittees. Some examples include the sub Subcommittee on Transportation, Housing and Urban Development, and the Subcommittee on Agriculture, Rural Development, and Food and Drug Administration. Each subcommittee conducts hearings on the programs under its jurisdiction and votes out a bill with funding levels for each program. The full appropriations committee in the House and Senate marks up the bill and sends it to the floor. Both chambers pass their bills and iron out the differences in a conference as mentioned earlier. The final vote is taken on the bill that comes out of the conference, then the bill goes to the president to sign or veto. Congress must pass and the president must sign appropriations bills by October 1st, which is the beginning of the fiscal year. To fund all of the national government departments, agencies, and programs for the following year, Congress has had a hard time agreeing on the budget in recent years. If Congress and the President fail to pass all the appropriations bills, there will be some agencies and programs that do not have the money appropriated to them that they are authorized to spend. In other words, there will be no money to spend on some legally established programs and national government functions. When this happens, the government either shuts down or Congress kicks the can down the road by passing a CR or continuing a resolution, which temporary which temporarily extends current funding for the programs and agencies that have not had appropriations bills passed and signed. Basically, a CR is a temporary budget extension that allows more time for debate. 
Last year, the president signed two CRs during fiscal year 20, which extended temporary funding through November 21st and then again through December 20th. A final appropriations deal was announced on December 16th. Congress passed and President Trump signed two final spending packages for fiscal year 20 on December 20th, 2019, which avoided a government shutdown and funded programs at HUD and USDA for fiscal year 2020. Another term you often hear is sequestration. Sequestration means across the board spending cuts across all, across all departments. This is triggered when spending levels are poised to exceed budget caps, which were created by the Budget Control Act in 2011. Congress has already agreed to lift the budget caps, so sequestration is not an issue for fiscal year 21. The budget caps established in the Budget Control Act are set to expire after fiscal year 21, so the appropriation cycle for fiscal year 22 will present new opportunities to advocate for significantly higher funding for affordable housing and community development programs for the first time in almost a decade. The President released his budget proposal for fiscal year 21 on February 10th, and the House and Senate are beginning to draft spending bills. The process of drafting and the process of drafting the spending bills is expected to move more quickly this year because the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2019 included top line numbers for fiscal years 20 and 21. So the House and Senate Appropriations Committees will jump right in with allocating money to the subcommittees. While top line numbers for fiscal year 20 included some significant increases for non-defense non discretionary programs, the budget agreement only allows for a small $5 billion funding increase for all non-defense discretionary programs in fiscal year 21. Because the cost of living rises each year, it is crucial that affordable housing programs receive increased funding from year to year to continue serving the households already being served by these programs. Also, it is because it is an election year, there will likely be a CR through the election. Housing programs rely on increased funding just to maintain their programs, so it's really important to focus our advocacy efforts on the budget. NLIHC, our state partners, and our members engage Congress each year to make sure that the affordable housing and transportation programs receive the highest amount of funding possible through sign-on letters and in-person meetings. Though we've seen gains in the last 10 years for both tenant-based and project-based rental assistance funding levels, funding levels for key HUD programs have decreased since fiscal year 10. The hardest hit HUD programs, as you can see, have been Section 811, that's Housing for Persons with Disabilities, and the two block grant programs, the Community Development Block Grant and the Home Investments Partnership Program, otherwise known as HOME. So now I'll hand it back over to Brooke. Great, thanks Kyle. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now that we've finished going over the legislative and budget processes, um, I'm gonna take a break to see if anyone has any questions. And just remember, you can ask your questions by typing them into the box on your screen. Um, seeing no questions at this time, um, we did have one question that I just want to share with everyone earlier, um, asking if we would be sending out the PowerPoint um, after today's webinar, and the answer is yes, we will be sharing that uh, via email, and it will be also, also available um, on our website after today's webinar. So uh, now I'm going to turn, uh, keep going and turn to some considerations about advocacy versus lobbying. Advocacy is when you provide information about an issue and organize support for your cause. If you're not taking a position on a specific piece of legislation, you're not lobbying. Anyone can participate in advocacy, whether you're an individual or work for a nonprofit. Lobbying is when you take a position on a specific piece of legislation. Sometimes people assume because they work for a 501c3 or a nonprofit that they can't lobby. But in fact, 501c3s can lobby if it fits in their mission. The limits to lobbying are usually estab established by the amount of lobbying that is done. So if an organization exceeds 5% of staff time or overall resources on lobbying, then that organization needs to register as a lobbyist or submit paperwork so they can be incorporated under the 501H designation rather than the 501C3. The 5% standard is often called the insubstantial part test. And many people who uh, lobby under a nonprofit do not actually reach this, this threshold. There are some great resources around lobbying as a nonprofit provided by the Boulder Advocacy Campaign of the Alliance for Justice. You can go to boulderadvocacy.org or talk to any of the NLHC housing advocacy organizers for more information. Now I'm going to talk about your role as an advocate and how you can use your knowledge of the legislative process to influence decision makers. 
The senators and representatives make their decisions about how they're going to vote based on personal and political values. First, they consider their political party. They may vote based on party lines. So if they're a Democrat and the Democratic Party has decided that they support a bill, they could support it uh, based on that. They also consider what their constituents value when voting on a bill. Their constituents are their voters, so they want to represent what their voters want, ensure they're doing their job, and get reelected. They may also consider their personal values, for example, their religious beliefs on caring for the poor. Political and financial feasibility of the vote are also taken into account. You may often hear that your representative would love to support more homeless programs, but there isn't money for it. Long-term members of Congress may avoid introducing bills or voting on bills that require any new spending. It is important to consider what you're asking your legislator to vote on. If you're asking for a very expensive request, it may be something that has to be worked out over a longer period of time, involving a larger advocacy campaign. Considering these factors, it is important to realize that what you as a constituent value is a key part of how legislators make their decisions. They need your opinions and expertise to make decisions on legislation. And if they don't make the right decisions, you can hold them accountable by voting them out of office. So does advocacy work? This is a question we get a lot at NLIHC. In short, the answer is a resounding yes. When we talk to staffers and legislators, we hear again and again that advocacy is important. The Congressional Management Foundation found that 94% of legislative staffers said that when a member of Congress hasn't come to a firm decision on an issue, in-person visits from constituents have a positive impact on their vote. The same study found that knowing how a bill will impact a district or state and knowing why a constituent supports or opposes a bill is crucial in making a decision about a bill. Unfortunately, members of Congress rarely get this information from their constituents. NLIHC has direct proof that advocacy works. There are so many examples. In recent years, there was a significant momentum from both HUD and the White House to back legislation pushing for harmful benefit cuts to housing programs, specifically in the form of rent increases and program time limits. NLIHC's members talked to legislators and their staff about the real impact that these programs would have on livelihoods of low-income households. In the end, none of the proposed reforms were in the final budget bills voted on by the House and Senate. We often also hear questions and comments like, well, I come from a very conservative state, and I know my senator is never going to become a champion on affordable housing. Or, I come from a very liberal state, and they already support these issues. Is it still worth me taking the time to talk to them? The answer is yes. It's important to consider that your role is not to take someone from the far left of the screen, uh, which is staunch opponent, to the far right of the screen, uh, which is staunch supporter, but rather to move the staunch opponent to the opponent or neutral position. That alone is very powerful. It makes it that much easier, easier to get legislation passed if there aren't major objections raised about it. On the other end, if a legislator who was a staunch supporter supporter isn't hearing from housing advocates, they could move to the supporter position or the natural or the neutral position on an issue, which uh, could decrease the chance of legislation getting passed. It's important to thank and praise members who do support affordable housing to keep them in that staunch supporter category and to ensure that our issues have champions in the legislature. Our supporters in Congress always appreciate when their leadership is acknowledged and praised. So now that we've covered the basics of how legislation moves through Congress and what your role is as an advocate, I'll turn it over to Elena to discuss what a Capitol Hill or other advocacy meeting looks like and how to ensure it goes successfully. So there are a few key things to consider about lobbying. First, remember that a Hill visit is just a conversation. It happens in halls of power with people that have influence, but in the end, it's just a simple conversation. Very often, the staff people or the member of Congress you'll be meeting with will have less information about the issue than you do, so very often, you will be the expert in the meeting. An additional consideration to keep in mind is that no Hill meeting is the final conversation you'll be having with any given individual. The best advocacy is advocacy that leads to building a relationship with a staff person or a member of Congress. So a Hill meeting is just one conversation in a series of conversations. So let's talk about what to do before your meeting. 
For those of you attending this year's Capitol Hill Day, the logistics of scheduling a meeting will vary. Some states will have captains who will set up meetings for their teams. Other smaller contingents will set up their own meetings. If you don't know the plan for Capitol Hill Day, talk to your NLIHC organizer. When scheduling a meeting, you should call the office you would like to meet with and ask for the scheduler. Some offices will ask you to fill out a form, but most of the time, a phone call will suffice. If you need help getting the name or number of the scheduler, ask one of the NLIHC organizers. And please note that the meeting will take place with higher level staff if the request comes from an actual constituent and not NLIHC staff. So we're happy to help if needed. Before setting up your meetings, make sure that you know where the offices are located, especially if you're scheduling multiple meetings in one day. The offices on Capitol Hill are spread out amongst a few buildings, and it takes time to walk between the buildings and to get through security. Plan on 15 minutes to go from one office to another, and then 45 minutes to move from the Senate buildings to the House building, partly because you'll have to go through security again. Planning accordingly is important so you don't arrive late to your meeting. When trying to schedule a meeting, calling about two to three weeks ahead is the best way to go. So if you're attending our Hill Day event on March 27th, right now is the time to begin scheduling these meetings. Calling further out than that can often lead to a request to call again. Many offices indicate that they don't know what votes will be happening that far out or which staffers will be available to meet. But of course, if you wait too long, the staff members may not have time to meet with you. I mentioned meeting with staff members because in most instances, that is who you'll be meeting with. Oftentimes, meeting with staff members is just as good or even better than meeting with the representative. The member of Congress relies on their staff for key information as they make decisions. It's also true that when you meet with staff, they are more likely to have a larger amount of time to explore the various issues that you're discussing and to ask good follow-up questions that provide for more dialogue. If possible, try to meet with the staff who handles housing policy. Oftentimes when you meet with a member of Congress, the meeting will be rather brief because of their busy schedules. If you can, research the member of Congress and the staff person you're meeting with before your meeting. For example, if you can say, it's been great meeting with you today. I was happy to see that the Congresswoman received an award on a particular issue. It shows that you're interested in what they are doing and not only looking for them to be interested in your issues. It establishes a tone of partnership that can be very helpful. If you're doing your meeting with a coalition of groups or with several people presenting on different issues, you'll want to determine who will speak when and who will, who will speak on what issue and makes what ask. If you're attending our Hill Day on March 27th, please note that there will be more resources in your Hill Day packet than you may want to bring up at any given meeting. You may choose to discuss three top issues out of the many that we provide for you. You may also wish to discuss a couple of policy issues that are not in our policy materials or in the Hill Day packet. These are your meetings, so make sure to treat them that way. Before your meeting, it's also important to prepare an elevator pitch, the major talking points you would like to discuss during your visit. Preparing these talking points ensures that you stay on message and include the most relevant and important topics during your brief meeting. Those are some key considerations before your meeting. So I'll turn it over to Kyle to share some key considerations for during your meeting. Number one, always introduce yourself and your organization if applicable and declare yourself a constituent of the member of Congress. Your effectiveness is largely based on geography because legislators are concerned about their constituents' priorities, experiences, and expertise. If you are not a constituent, explain how your organization works with this member of Congress and their constituents and provide services in that district. You should use the meeting to educate your elected official and or staff members about the work that you do and the issues that you care about. Remember, if your organization does not allow you to lobby as a representative, you can still refer to your work as informing your perspective on any given issue during the meeting. You should as often as possible provide data and experiences about the issues you are talking about. Very often this takes the shape of numbers and stories. At NLIHC, we work very hard to take the national data that we collect and break it down at the congressional district or local level so that some facts about the affordable housing crisis are expressed in a way that has a local context. We'll share an example of that on the next slide. A second thing to remember is to connect your work to the elected official as much as possible. This is another reason why you should do research on them before you meet. If you can connect your work on affordable housing to the elected official's interest in better outcomes for children, this will often create a key connection that will lead to a stronger relationship as you move forward. Always make a specific ask meeting. 
Make sure that when you talk about an issue, you connect it to the budget, a specific piece of legislation, or perhaps a dear colleague letter that a representative is serving with. Something that your member of Congress can support or oppose. Make it a question they can give you a yes or no answer to. Most often they'll give you the answer of, this is helpful information and we'll think about it. This is fully acceptable. You can use that as an opportunity to call up later to provide more information or to see if they have any further questions. Or say you should always make a specific ask in meetings, but in some cases you may have meetings with staff or legislators who don't understand the issue of housing very well and are considering the issue of affordable housing for the first time. In some of these instances, your meeting will primarily cover background information and you will be providing a lot of detail about what affordable housing is and why it matters. You might not get into the finer points of policy until you do a follow-up conversation over the phone or at another meeting, but it's important to remember that these meetings are also very important. Try to leave behind materials. If you leave behind materials, it's more difficult for them to forget about you immediately after you leave. When leaving behind materials, you should not assume that they will necessarily be read, but you can reference them in your follow-up. If you're participating in NLIHC's Hill Day, make sure to notify your organizer what meetings you get scheduled as soon as possible so they can be sure to have your leave behind materials ready for you on Capitol Hill Day. So now I'm going to cover uh, congressional district profiles. These are probably most applicable to members of Congress and their staff. Here's an example on your screen, and you can use it to highlight the need for more affordable homes in your state and support your ask in your meetings. As you can see on this housing profile, the top level statistics are broken down on the congressional district level. This shows members of Congress how the issue of affordable housing touches their district. The second level of statistics are statewide, and the third is regional, which shows statistics for metropolitan areas and counties in the congressional district. Again, for those of you participating on March 27th, make sure to let your organizer at NLIC know what meetings you get scheduled so that we can have the appropriate congressional district housing profile in each leave behind packet that we make for you. You can also find these on our website at NLIHC.org under housing needs by state or stop by the Legislative Action Center during the policy forum event. After your meeting, you should send a thank you email or perhaps even do a thank you tweet or blog post. Be sure to take a picture during your meeting so that you can include it in this follow-up. This allows you to share about the meeting publicly. You can say something like, we were happy to meet with our legislator and discuss affordable housing issues, and we look forward to working with them in the future. Publicly, publicly expressing your gratitude for the availability of the members of Congress and their staff is an opportunity to strengthen your relationship. It also reminds them that they are accountable to follow up on the commitments they made to you or to get more information on questions they said they needed answered. Secondly, you should share what you learn during a Hill meeting with your network. Share with your members, your board, your volunteers, and especially share with us at NLHC. We can take the information you provide and follow up with a specific action item to clarify any questions the members of Congress or staff might have and um, engage in any specific legislation. We're in a better position when we know what outcomes there are from your meetings. Finally, always follow up and work to build relationship with the office. Make sure you're continuing the conversation. Advocacy should not be considered something that you do in one meeting, but rather a process that begins with one meeting. All right. Thanks, Kyle. We're going to move forward with the role play of a Hill visit right now. Um, because many of you on today's webinar may not have participated in a Capitol Hill or other advocacy meeting before, we want to just provide this very simple role play of what a meeting might look like. Um, the role play is going to be done by Elena and Kyle. And we'll go over a general example of how to conduct your visit and then move into how to handle um, a couple of difficult questions that um, may be asked. Elena will be playing the role of a legislative assistant, and Kyle will be playing the part of you, the advocate, visiting their member of Congress. Hi there. Good morning. I'm Kyle Arbuckle. I'm with Austin Clemens Agency in Kansas, and a constituent of Representative Smith. Thanks for meeting with me today. Thanks for coming in. My name is Elena Calabro, and I'm the legislative assistant for Congresswoman Smith. I'm sorry that she can't meet with you today, but I'm happy to be meeting with you, and we'll be sure to share our conversation with her. Thanks. Uh, it's great to meet you. Um, so first, let me give you this packet of data and fact sheets I'll be referencing during our conversation. Oh, great. These materials are always very helpful. No problem. I'm here today to share a little bit about myself and to discuss some key housing issues with you. As I mentioned, I'm a constituent of Congresswoman Smith, and I work at Awesome Home with the agency in Kansas. I've been with the organization for 10 years, and over the past three years, I've been working closely with the Resident Advisory Board, where residents get together to represent their interests at various public housing sites. My organization is also a member of the National Low Income Housing Coalition, a nonprofit dedicated solely to achieving socially just public policy that ensures people with the lowest incomes in the United States have affordable and decent homes. 
I scheduled this meeting with you to discuss my concern about the lack of affordable homes for the lowest income households, including the population I work with. We've had great success in addressing homelessness in our state with proven programs such as rental assistance and permits, for housing, but the support we're getting from the federal government just isn't enough to house everyone experiencing homelessness in Kansas. That's really unfortunate, but as I'm sure you know, we're in a difficult budget environment where we're going to have to make some very difficult choices. That's true. The budget environment is difficult. In the packet I gave you, though, there is this budget chart showing the level of funding for various HUD programs over the previous budget years. As you can see, the support for subsidized housing programs hasn't been keeping pace with the needs, of, uh, needs in our communities. If you take a look at the congressional district profile in that packet, you'll see that NLIHC has broken down the number of affordable and available homes for the congressman's district, showing a shortage of over 15,000 homes for extremely low-income households. This means a shortage of housing that is affordable and available. And when I use the term available, I don't mean that it's just sitting empty. We mean that it's not currently occupied by people with higher incomes. Wow, these numbers are high. So where does this data come from? Glad you asked. These numbers come from the National Income Housing Coalition using HUD data. I want to also draw your attention to the numbers on cost burden and severe cost burden. A household is cost burden if they're paying more than 30% of their income on rent and essential utilities. And they're severely cost burden if they're paying more than 50% of their income on as you can see, the problem is most severe as the income levels get lower. This data is certainly useful. Can I follow up if there are any questions about this? Yes, for sure. And if there is anything I can, if there is anything I can't answer, I can put you in touch with advocates at the National Home and Housing Coalition. Great, thank you. I'd like to share one final point with you. Many people wrongly believe that extremely low-income people are already being served by federal housing policy because of the perceived prevalence of vouchers and public housing units. But the truth is that only one out of four households that needs housing assistance act assistance act actually receives it. And due to inflation, increase in the HUD budget needed each year just to maintain programs at their current levels. For this reason, we want to see an increase in affordable housing resources. Can I ask, do you know if the Congresswoman will be supporting the Home Fraud Act, HR 5244? This bill would improve and significantly expand public housing and affordable apartments built with the National Housing Trust Fund while also preventing displacement. I know that she values the programs that HUD operates and will certainly take a strong stance to defend those funding levels. Unfortunately, as we discussed, we're in a tough budget environment, so I don't expect us to get very far beyond flat funding for programs this year. But we'll certainly push to increase resources where we can. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate her support, and we'll be sure to follow up with any, any additional information that might be helpful to the Congresswoman. Great. Thanks for stopping in today. So that was an example of a pretty standard meeting, but there's a variety of things that can happen, so we urge you to be flexible. Sometimes you can have a meeting with a staff person or a member of Congress who doesn't agree with supporting affordable housing programs and has some challenging questions. Sometimes there will be difficulty in scheduling, and you will have your meeting in the lobby of the office. Just do your best to be as flexible as you can. Now we'll share a few examples of some difficult questions so you can get a sense of how to react in a meeting when you're shown some opposition. If while going through these questions, you come up with your own and you would like feedback on how to respond, feel free to type them into the questions box and we'll try to get to them today. So one question we hear often is, how are we going to fund more housing? And one solution you can discuss is protecting and expanding the National Housing Trust Fund like this. The Housing Trust Fund is the only Federal housing program exclusively focused on providing states with flexible resources targeted to serve households with the clearest and most acute housing needs. My organization supports efforts to expand the housing trust fund through any infrastructure bill, housing finance reform, and any other legislative avenues. By law, 90% of housing trust fund dollars must be used for the production, preservation, rehabilitation, or operation of affordable rental housing. Up to 10% may be used to support home ownership activities for first time home buyers who are very low income. The Housing Trust Fund is currently supported by a 4.2 basis points assessment on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which means that it is funded outside of the appropriations process. This can be expanded via housing finance reform or infrastructure packages. So that was an example of a fairly technical answer, but it's also okay if you decide to speak more broadly about funding federal solutions to address the shortage of affordable and available homes. Here's another question. You're presenting a lot of information about the affordable housing crisis that we all acknowledge is an issue. But what can Congress do about it? What solutions can Congress offer? Well, Congress has already offered significant solutions for many years through programs that are proven to be effective. They just need to be funded at an appropriate scale to make an impact that meets the needs brought on by the housing shortage. We hear on our end from local leaders that they need resources, they need greater resources from the federal government to be able to address homelessness and affordable housing. 
What about state and local governments, though? Aren't they better equipped to handle their unique challenges with housing and homelessness? Sometimes they can be better equipped, yes, but in terms of the actual administration of programs, and I think that's why programs such as the Community Development Block Grant have consolidated funds done at the local level. The low-income housing tax credit has a qualified allocation plan that is done at the state level, or even house, housing choice vouchers are distributed through local public housing agencies. But state and local governments on their own don't have the resources to make an impact on the grant scale that the federal government can. And that's why we look at the federal government for solutions. Are you concerned that these programs will just lock people into a condition of poverty and make people dependent on continuing to receive these programs? Well, it's pretty common that people think there needs to be accountability for low-income people who receive housing assistance. But the fact is, people, many people who receive housing subsidies are not eligible to work because they're elderly or have a disability. Of those who are eligible to work, most of them do. If you look at your state housing profile that I have in that packet there, you'll see that we've broken down extremely low-income households to reflect who's participating in the workforce, who's a senior, who cannot work due to disability or caretaker responsibility as well. At most, 10% of extremely low-income households can be thought of as choosing not to work. But even in most cases, even in those cases, it is more like we just don't have data on them and they might be underemployed. Very often, people do not make enough money or face other barriers such as child care and transportation. So work alone does not necessarily solve someone's ability to afford their home. But what we do know is that people who receive housing assistance try to work every bit as much as people who don't receive housing subsidies. Great. So, okay, it looks like we have one question here. Is there a primer that will be provided with a brief overview of major federal housing programs, current legislation, uh, general discussion points and responses to difficult questions. That is a great question. Um, so the answer is that, uh, yes, we have um, a few resources that could answer each of those questions. Uh, the first is a resource we put out annually um, called the Advocates Guide, which provides, um, a, it's a very comprehensive resource for all federal housing and community development programs. Um, and it's available on our website at nlihc.org. Um, and if you reach out to any of us, um, we can, we're happy to send that as well. Um, I will try to remember to include a link. Um, I'm gonna make a note right now, actually. Uh, include a link to it for people to access. Uh, so that's that covers the major federal housing programs, um, an overview, as well as um, what the asking uh, that you know the asks are for each of them um, where advocacy is applicable. Um, as far as current legislation and general discussion points, we're going to be going over that next week in our policy priorities webinar. That's on March 12th at 2 p.m. Eastern time, so same time and place next week um, on Thursday. And um, as far as the responses to difficult questions, uh, we would be happy to uh, kind of help you either walk through that over the phone or type some stuff, um, uh, you know, some questions that you might expect at a meeting. Happy to work through that with you. Um, just contact your housing advocacy organizer. That will be, uh, be Joey Lindstrom, Kyle Arbuckle, Victoria Bure, or myself, Brooke Shipwright. Um, and you can find us uh, who covers your state on our website, again, nlihc.org. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Seeing no others coming through um, the chat box here, uh, we have just a few more slides before we wrap up. As you may know, we have a second webinar next week on March 12th, like I just said, at 2 p.m. Eastern time, um, where we're gonna be going over our policy priorities. So um, please sure, be sure to tune into that webinar. Um, it'll answer your questions about specific policy asks to include during your Hill Day visits this spring or any other advocacy meetings you might be doing um, this year. So before we end today's webinar, we want to let you know other ways you can be involved uh, with NLIHC. The first is through NLIHC membership. Our role at NLIHC is to elevate your voice on Capitol Hill and membership contributions support this work. So please consider becoming a member today. Finally, here's some contact information so you can stay in touch with the field team. Uh, like I said, there's four of us um, on this page. Feel free to take down our phone numbers, um, emails, or uh, Twitter handles and get in touch with us. 
anytime you have a question about Hill Day, housing policy, or how you can get more involved with NLIHC, please don't hesitate to reach out anytime. Uh, getting to hear from you is truly our favorite thing about our job. So with that, I want to thank you all for attending. Uh, again, please tune in next week for our webinar on policy priorities. Have a great day, everyone.